I'm really looking forward to uh, to this conversation. This is one of our first sessions, like really truly U.S. based. We've spent we've traveled across the whole world at this point. Um, started in Hong Kong in the first hour, the second hour of our program, moved west to Mauritius, um, and uh, traveled to four or five countries, danced with a bunch of folks, and now we are here in New York, Indiana, uh, and a couple other places. So without further ado, Eileen, let me hand it off to you uh, to introduce our panel, our conversation for today. Okay. And then we'll dive right in. All right. So on behalf of Joe Angiello, Barry Eisenberg, Jesse Eisenberg, Anastasia Pratt, Jeff Ritter, and Elise Tacheron. I am particularly grateful for the opportunity to partake in today's vigil. It's truly a privilege to be here. So um, on a personal note, I want to thank President Jim Malatras of SUNY Empire State College for his support with the Holocaust Education Initiative. I have been working on the examination of the World War II occupation of France for over 22 years. And that began with my interviewing Holocaust survivors, hidden children, resistance fighters, righteous Gentiles, and members of the US <laughs> military, servicemen and women that were in France during the, particularly during the D-Day invasion. So um, I'm grateful to be here. Um, the three people that I want to recognize today that are, that are particularly meaningful to me are Marcel Jablot, who survived the death march of Auschwitz, Janine Gotkin, who was a hidden child in France, and Lucia Brock, who was a member of the French resistance in Lyon, France. And Lucia Brock is the member of the resistance who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Klaus Barbie who was the butcher of Lyon, and she won. She was, she was famous for that, and she gratefully gave an interview for the film that I worked on, which I will speak about in a bit. Um, but I want to take a quick little excerpt, since I've honored the three people that have since passed since the making of the film, to allow Elise to honor the members of her family that were victims of the Armenian genocide. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, I really want to thank everyone, uh, Marcus, David, everyone on this call for letting me be here at such short notice. Um, I'm third generation Armenian born in Bulgaria, so I just wanted to read um, some of the surnames of um, relatives that have um, passed. So here they are, I'll be quick. Um, Derderian, Muradian, Kalpakcian, Kyrkjian, Akaragian, Reisian, Torusian, Chakarian, Mikaelian, Agupian, Shahinian, Hovanesian, Terjelian, Horasanjian, Kajian, and Papazian. Thanks again, everyone. Um, Elise, do you want to talk about April 24th, just before we go back to what I was talking about? Yes, thank you for reminding me. I forgot to mention that the commemoration of the Armenian Genocide is always held on April 24th every year. Um, so I was uh, very, you know, uh, honored to be here at the end of the month uh, to do this with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I especially appreciate you coming because I don't think I would have done as the justice to the names of your family as well as you did. So thank you, Elise. <laughs> okay, so my work with teaching the interdisciplinary lessons of the Holocaust is not limited just to history. I work with feature length films and documentaries. And as I said, I've been working with survivor testimony. And David said that he was going to bring up the website for France Divided, which was one of the first projects that I worked on. Um, this provides a concise overview of the film. And what's important to remember about France during World War II, it is the only country in the world that can say the following four things. It was defeated by the Germans, occupied by the Germans, collaborated with the Germans, and declared victory over the Germans. They're the, once again, they're, it was defeated, occupied, collaborated, and declared victory. Only country in the world that can say that. Many other countries can say that they were occupied and, or collaborated, but they can't say all four. And remember that the, after the war was over, 
it was the four leaders, the US, France, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union that defeated the Germans. And that's where that public image comes from. So what the film does is it shows via seven testimonies of people that were survivors, hidden children, members of the resistance, and Lucio Brock is one of them, their perspectives of what it was like to live in France during the occupation. One of my, I know I shouldn't say favorite survivors, but one of the most touching memories of one of my survivors was with Regine Barshak, who was one of the few survivors of the Valdiv Roundup which was July 16th and 17th, 1942. It was the largest mass arrest of French citizens in wartime history. Over 13,122, notice I say over because that figure sometimes is, is a little supple, um, but roughly eight to 12 people survived that and Regime was one of them. And she survived because her mother um, was very clever in saying to one of the Dronsi leaders that my daughter was born in France, so she's a French citizen, so she should not be deported. And that camp leader literally did not get the memo that all French Jews, whether born in France or not, should be deported. So the camp leader says, yes, you're right. He made a new ID card for Reg Regina. And she and her brother walked, the, the, walked back to Paris on foot and hid in their apartment. So it's a very compelling story. And the reason I wanted to share her story with you all is because when I was interviewing her, she gave me one of her yellow stars. And she gave me her yellow star, she said, because long after I'm no longer here, I know you'll take good care of this and make sure that future generations know what happened. And I take that very seriously. And by being here today, I'm able to maintain my promise to all those that share their story with me and continue to share my, their stories with me that they're not forgotten. So thank you, David. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you all to my SUNY Empire colleagues for being here today. So I want to transition um, by explaining about how I use feature length films in the classroom. Um, it's an art draws the student in, draws the audience helps us to feel what it was like to be in that time period. And recently, Barry Eisenberg talked to me about his son's film, Resistance, knowing that I worked on the World War II uh, period of France. And he said to me, did you know that Marcel Marceau was part of the French Resistance? Bearing in mind, I've been working on this for over 22 years. And I said, no, I had no idea. It's amazing how many stories, just when I think I've gotten a grasp on pretty much everything that could possibly be a detour or a change or something new about France, I learned something new, which is really, which is good in a way because I keep learning. But Jesse's film, I will be using with my students this fall when I teach my World War II course. And we're gonna watch a brief trailer of the film right now. Imagine fighting this war as a civilian. Imagine not knowing how to shoot a gun, challenging the Nazis to save lives. I have just heard an incredible story. That makes your sacrifices completely worth it. 123 children. Their parents were just killed by Nazis. We need to train them to survive. What good does it do to teach them fear? I think it's important to help the children laugh in the middle of this war. There's a group in Lyon arming themselves to fight back. We need to find guns. We need to learn how to shoot. Do you really think I could help anyone with a gun? Of course not. Your passports are impressive. Look at this. Marcel Marceau. It's a great name. Welcome to the Resistance. Why are we fighting a war we can't win? We can kill all the Nazis. We can kill some. Or you can save some lives. 
We want to take them out to France. See if we can get across the border. Tell me where they are. I don't know where they are. You do know! In every generation, they rise up against us. Sometimes a powerful man, sometimes an army, tries to destroy the Jewish people. But here we are, together. You are not alone. What's the best way to resist? It's not to kill them. It's to survive. So there's many, many ways that I can describe how I will use this film with my students, but I'd like to turn this over now to Jesse and Barry. Oh, thanks a lot, Eileen, um, for your work and for uh, showing that. Um, so yeah, the movie is about Marcel Marceau became after this movie, the most famous mime in the world. Um, and of course the movie seems like it's this kind of, you know, miraculous story. Um, and it is a miraculous story, but I think uh, something that Eileen alluded to uh, proved correct in my kind of preparing for the movie, which is that any story uh, of survival during that war um, required a kind of a miracle. Um, and in fact, um, uh, my father and I uh, um, had family who survived that war and, um, and it was through it was through um, uh, miracles as well, which he can talk about after. I just wanted to mention one brief kind of anecdote that spoke to my experience, both uh, broadly about survival and more specifically about um, my experience doing that movie. We were filming a lot of the movie in Munich, which of course is by uh, Dachau, which is about like 20 minutes outside the city of Munich. Um, and uh, as you saw in the trailer, the character says the best way to resist is not to try to pick off one Nazi at a time in France, although that could be helpful, but they felt that they would best be serving uh, the cause of survival, a uh, cause of resisting by just surviving, and that if they can simply survive, it would be the greatest act of resistance. Anyway, so we filmed that scene in uh, Munich, and on the weekend, I went with my wife and my baby, who was like one or two at the time, to Dachau to see. Uh, of course, I thought I figured the baby was too young to, you know, understand any of the horrors, obviously. So I thought it would just, he would just be coming along with my wife and I who wanted to see it. And while we were there, my baby started running around, um, like uh, where the barracks were. And he was laughing because he was running around on what was just overgrown former barracks. And um, at first it was kind of mortifying because I didn't want to, you know, bring any kind of levity to what should be a somber experience uh, for other you know, guests there as well, visitors. And, um, and then I realized as the baby was running around and laughing that it was exactly speaking to what the characters were talking about in the movie, which is that the best way to resist that kind of hatred, that kind of, you know, a genocide or attempted genocide is to just survive it. And to see a child, you know, we're Jewish, uh, running around the place where they tried to uh, systematically destroy all of his ancestors felt to me like this kind of wonderful, uh, you know, cosmic um, uh, victory. And uh, it was really touching and it kind of spoke to the truth of what the characters talk about in the movie. And my father's here, Barry, um, who will talk about our personal connection to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jess. Um, uh, to pick up on that, first, I just do want to say that I'm really honored to be sharing this experience with my colleagues, Eileen and Jeff and Anastasia and Joe. Uh, and I couldn't be more thankful to the Together We Remember Coalition for organizing and sponsoring this. Um, I really, um, I'm so honored to be doing this with Jesse today. We talk about this uh, quite a bit. Um, I couldn't be more proud of him. Uh, I'm not talking about his professional accomplishments uh, today. That's a separate thing, but uh, really for the good and uh, incredibly thoughtful person that he is. Um, as Jesse said, this is all very personal for us, as, as it is for so many people. Um, it probably is hard to find a family anywhere that in some fashion, whether it's directly like for us or indirectly, hasn't been um, touched by some 
you know, some aspect of hatred in some way. Um, my parents were the first generation of, uh, to be born uh, in the United States. My father's family was from Poland and my mother's was from Austria. Um, both of my grandmothers were able to get out before it became impossible to get out. Um, and uh, they were fortunate also to come here. Each of them just coincidentally had four brothers that they, uh, that they came with. Um, but everybody else in their family, whether it was, um, you know, parents, cousins, uh, uh, aunts, uncles, all were killed. Um, my grandfathers uh, both were not quite as fortunate. They were the only ones to make it out of their, uh, you know, from their families to get out. Um, but all the rest uh, perished. That's aunts, uncles, cousins, um, you know, everybody. As I grew out of childhood, I began to uh, it began to occur to me that um, no one in the family really ever spoke about the Holocaust. My grandparents never did, and my and and my parents, I guess, followed their lead, but they rarely spoke about it as well. At least not in my presence. Um, they were all very quiet about it. Um, I could appreciate that they were trying to protect us, each generation trying to protect the next one down. Um, but maybe it was also just too painful. Uh, maybe it was a memory that they had to suppress. Um, maybe they had survivor's guilt. You know, I, 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 I don't know. Um, but I did sense there was something else that was going on, that there was some sort of a code of silence that seemed to be ingrained in them. And it's a little bit of like what, you know, what Jesse said, because um, back then calling attention to oneself was, uh, was dangerous, um, you know, and was fatal. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I, I always had the sense that there was something going on and I think I was, you know, in some ways when it first dawned on, you know, when it first dawned on me, um, I remember my parents being, you know, sort of reluctant to talk about it. Um, but silence really isn't very helpful anymore and that's why it's important to discard it. Um, today when the uh, open expressions of anti-Semitism and hatred toward many other groups are on the rise. Um, we need to be more mindful of, uh, you know, of speaking out. And that's why the Together We Remember Coalition is so important. And that's why it's an honor to be part of this event today, uh, to pay tribute to those who's, um, who lost their lives in the Holocaust. In humanizing and uh, remembering each person by name, we're also calling attention to the most gross and vile form of injustice that human beings can perpetrate on one another. Um, I'm particip uh, participating today uh, to honor just a very few relatives. Um, the eight people whose names I'll mention were all killed in Polish concentration camps in 1943 and 1944. Um, there's my great-grandfather, Baruch Eisenberg, and that's how the name was pronounced back then. I'd like to uh, just extend an appreciation. I think my cousin Lauren might be on today. Um, and and uh, just before I mention the other names, I just want to express my appreciation to her because it was from an extensive genealogical review uh, that uh, that allowed us to really chronicle the you know all, uh, uh, all of the relatives who passed away. So there was my great grandfather Baruch Eisenberg. There were four sisters of my grandfather, four of Baruch's uh, daughters, um, whose names I'd also like to mention. That's Malka, Mariam, Sura, and Estera. On my grandmother's side, there's Menechem Nirenberg, who was a great aunt. Um, and then there were two cousins, Hertz Binder and Yona Binder. They had a sister whose name was Maria. Um, and Maria, when Maria was four years old, she was given to a Christian family uh, for safekeeping. She was the only one who survived. Um, the kindness of that family uh, is like a ray of sunshine in the bleakness. That's what gives us hope. Um, I'd like to dedicate at least, you know, my portion of this to that family. That's the Grieber family. Um, it's that kind of selflessness in, you know, in, in the presence of the most horrific kind of danger uh, that is so inspirational. And uh, as a matter of fact, several Several years ago, Jesse did go to visit Maria, who's still alive and living in Poland. Um, and uh, he wrote a play based on her life. Um, so it's sort of, 
you know, it, it personalized it even more than, uh, you know, than what might have been otherwise. So I'd like to thank everybody who's listening today uh, and joining in. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully this will be part of an ongoing uh, and continuing discussion um, around hate and violence and what we need to do uh, to make sure that that, uh, that that comes to an end. Thank you so much. And I believe it is, it's Jeff who goes next? Yes, it's Jeff's turn. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you, ba thank you Barry, and, and good morning, everyone. It's, it's an honor to be here with um, my, my, my good friends. I'm, 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 I'm humbled by this process. Um, growing up in New York City, and well, specifically in the Bronx, I recall a lot of the senior citizens in my neighborhood having numbers on their arms and at the time being too young to really understand and um, now obviously um, over the years I've come to completely understand. Um, I played high school and college baseball and I just have a quick baseball story. I was lucky enough to be uh, invited to uh, try out for a professional baseball team. Uh, this was back in college. Um, I worked part-time in New York City and uh, the, the tryout was in Texas. I had a few quote unquote uncles who I worked with who raised money for myself and my dad to travel to Texas. Um, it was a surprise, it was an honor and three out of the four were Holocaust survivors and they were just so pleased to be to have been able to help me. I'll never forget that gratitude and kindness. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, finally, I, I'd like to remember uh, and recognize two people who made it here to the United States from Poland. My grandmother, Dorothy Pearl, and my uncle Joseph Izbitsky. They were born in Poland uh, became uh, British citizens and before the war were able to make it to the United States. Uh, the rest of the family were wiped out. Uh, unfortunately, there are just way too many names to read. I can't do that at this point. It's way too emotional, but I do, I do this in their honor. And again, I want to thank everyone for their time and um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joe, thank you're you, next. Jeff. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, Jeff. Before I begin, um, I'd like to mention that um, I attended a couple of times early, earlier today, and uh, David and Marcus, uh, you guys have done just a wonderful job um, organizing uh, this really incredibly important event. And uh, like uh, Jeff, I too am humbled uh, to have been invited. And uh, it's always an honor uh, to be included in anything that Eileen is organizing and in which, um, truly, in which uh, Barry, Jeff, Anna and uh, are involved and um, it's nice to meet uh, Jesse as well for the uh, first time. So um, <laughs> this for us uh, was to begin uh, as a, a reading of names and uh, when it uh, morphed into a um, you know kind of a personal history I um, and I perseverated quite a bit about uh, what I would say that would bring uh, some meaning uh, to this event. And um, I may have succeeded, uh, you'll be the, uh, the judge of that. Um, and the events surrounding you know, Auschwitz in Poland, uh, Dachau, Buchenwald in, uh, Buchenwald in uh, Germany, and more recent events in uh, Syria. I think that was the subject of the immediately previous um, uh, presentation, Rwanda, Cambodia, and the list is as long as our arms. 
uh, these are abstractions uh, for many people. They're just ideas. They're certainly not um, ideas from this time. Even uh, books uh, that I read uh, more than one time, many times actually, like uh, Elie uh, Wiesel's uh, Night and Victor Frankl's In uh, Search of Meaning and uh, Anne Frank's uh, diary, they, they seem to describe things that are so far away, things that could not possibly have happened, and yet uh, they did happen. Um, by the estimate that I think all of you are familiar with, six million uh, Jewish people perished as a result of uh, Hitler's final uh, solution. And um, uh, this is a good starting place for me. Uh, the Holocaust actually serves as a really appropriate proxy for all of the uh, atrocities and the events that we remember today and uh, together we remember uh, because the Holocaust was so all-encompassing. It wasn't the exclusive preserve of uh, Jews. It included people of different faiths different countries, homosexuals, uh, communists, socialists, political adversaries of all stripes, uh, the Roma you know, who wandered about Europe, and anyone who uh, really did not uh, fit into the very narrow uh, range of uh, traits uh, that were acceptable in uh, Nazism and the Nazi uh, philosophy. Um, so now for my personal involvement. Um, uh, this coming from a guy who uh, fortunately came into the world in 1944, by the way, so I go back a little bit farther than, um, than Jeff does, um, uh, who came into the world with fairly broad shoulders and accordingly was not even bullied uh, many times in his life, maybe a tussle uh, here and there. Um, but yet I, I did have a, um, I did come into contact with many people who were victimized by uh, various atrocities. I, like Jeff, uh, was born in the Bronx. And I lived next door to a building that we knew as the Shulam Aleichem, which was filled largely uh, with uh, Jewish uh, people. And one of my neighbors there uh, told me a story. Actually, I heard many stories, uh, beginning with my earliest memory, a butcher who had the concentration camp tattoo on his arm. And uh, he apparently uh, caught me looking at it. and they, asked if I knew what it was. I probably was nine or 10 at the time. And I said, I didn't. And he explained to me, uh, not too graphically, I think in some ways, uh, people who were uh, victimized uh, by that uh, particular um, oppression uh, were like, uh, we often describe the greatest generation as the greatest generation. Uh, they didn't talk too much about it, they suffered um, but uh, didn't share too much, certainly didn't wear their hearts on their, uh, their sleeves. But anyway, back to the man. Um, he told me a story that uh, tracked pretty Joe, you accidentally hit your, your mute button. Yeah, okay, is that better? Much better, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, I looked up and saw the, uh, that the microphone was X'd out and I said, oh no, <laughs> how long has that been there? Uh, but anyway, uh, you heard me refer to the man I met in my neighborhood. Yep, we only lost you for two seconds, Joe, so oh, you, were, you, you were talking okay. about, yep. Okay, okay, good. So the man uh, told me a story that uh, tracked pretty closely with an N NPR interview that I had heard. I think the man was German. I think he was in Berlin, and he told about a particular day uh, that his family was going to be uh, corralled and sent off 
to uh, whatever place it was determined they would be sent off to. The possibilities included uh, labor camps and of course uh, annihila annihilation uh, camps. Um, uh, those really are uh, pretty close related ideas because people in labor camps were not, uh, you know, they, they labored and they produced things, but uh, they weren't fed sumptuous meals. The expectation was they would produce and they would die whenever they died. And that was fine because it was part of the final solution anyway. But uh, the fact of the matter is um, they were uh, preparing uh, to be uh, branded, coded, whatever, and uh, sent off to, to somewhere. So uh, that day, his mother uh, eyed him up and down and made him dress in his long uh, pants in the hope that he, uh, then 13-year-old boy, I believe, uh, would look more like a man and hopefully be sent to a labor camp and not to the annihilation camp. So the last time this man saw his mother was when she was walking away uh, with the daughter um, toward this train that would take them to the annihilation camp. The mother was holding his sister by her hand and his sister was holding her doll by the hand. And that was his, his last picture, um, his last experience with, with his family. Uh, so I don't need to hear too many other stories. Um, that one is emblematic of just, you know, the worst thing that could possibly happen to, to any human being. Um, a number of years ago, um, I designed a master's degree, not so many years ago, it was actually in 2012. And um, it has a modest, uh, not overwhelming fo following. And the master's degree is called Community and Economic Development. And I ask students in that program to tear themselves away just for a minute from traditional measures of economic success, measures like gross domestic product, uh, the number of widgets produced, or the number of companies that you've attracted to your particular town or city. And in place of that, I ask students to think about what the world would look like if we were to use different yardsticks to measure our uh, progress. Uh, the kinds of yardsticks that I have in mind, and these, these are not, obviously not original ideas uh, with me, include the sustainability of your plan for development, uh, the quality of life that results from your plan for development, happiness, peace, love. Um, I would be sanguine about uh, this kind of effort making a difference in the world, but I have to say uh, my uh, hopefulness about that is punctuated uh, by my concern as uh, a concern I obviously share with uh, Barry, who spoke a few moments ago, um, about extremism, you know, it's alive and well. And uh, for that reason, we need to keep remembering. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Well, we're gonna have you. to, okay, yep. we're, we're, gonna, Anna, we're gonna let Anastasia have a chance and then we okay. can read some yep. names because we're running out of time. Okay, okay. very good, sorry. Yep. That's okay, you're fine. Anastasia? Thank you, so thank you for letting me join you. 
Um, my background is very different, I think, from, from my fellow panelists. I'm primarily French-Canadian Catholic descended, and my family was all here during the Holocaust. Um, but I'm a public historian, and as a public historian, I'm very interested in collective memory and how we, we help to take on the memories of those who came before us by using their photographs and their stories, and we bring their voices into the present. And so this was a very, very important um, this is a very important event for me, and I'm grateful to be able to help do that, to bring people into the present and, and help bring them into the future so that we do not forget their stories. Um, whichever genocide took their lives, whichever political action happened, part of that for me is, is the social justice mission, um, which is an Empire State College um, focus definitely, but certainly a personal focus as well, that we remember not only just to remember, but also to try to stop things like any kind of atrocity from happening in the future. And so that's, that's what I'm doing today. I'm here to remember those folks. The quick aside is that during graduate school, I did live in Besançon, France, which was part of occupied France, and um, certainly spent many hours in the Musée de la Résistance in the Citadel in Besançon to try to begin that work of, of remembering, the, the work that Marianne Hirsch calls post-memory, of, of bringing those folks with me. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you. So David and Marcus, I think we're ready now to start reading names. Sure, I'll go ahead and get that queued up. Uh, just give me a moment. Anastasia, we're gonna have lots to discuss in the future. We have lots of common ground. <laughs> And I'll begin. Jamal Adam Nusur perished in the Darfur genocide at the age of 20. Hamid Adnan Mahmoud Al Mubarak Al Kawarit Al Dahi perished in the Syrian civil war in 2013. Rahim Kastrati perished in the Kosovo war at the age of 47. Pincus Diatlas Blackwi Wiki perished in the Holocaust at age at the age of thirty-six. Juan Pizhnetsky perished in the Argentine Dirty War. Maleki Rashiti perished in the Kosovo War at the age of fifteen. Rosa Koplog six perished in the Holocaust at the age of 39. This is an athlete. Derek. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Derek perished in the Rwanda genocide in 1994. Mukan Kusi perished in the Rwandan genocide at the age of three. Boris Litvin perished in the Holocaust at the age of 19. Ahmed Presnicki perished in the Co uh, Kosovo War at the age of 63. Whoever has loud TV in the background, could you go on mute or... Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Mukantabana Elizabeth perished in the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Gershan Kabran perished in the Holocaust at the age of 31. Neximji Zaka perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 47. Mm -hmm. 
Bengovi Jaramo perished in the Bosnian genocide at age of 43. Dora Blah, Blah perished in the Holocaust at the age of 60. Planik SF perished in the Bosnian genocide at the age of 15. Rose. I'm, I'm sorry, we missed yeah. one there, Rosa Abraham. Oh. Is, sorry. This is uh, Tabovic Salim, perished in the Bosnian genocide at the age of 20. Jacob Arifi, perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 47. Yishak Shiftel, perished perished in the Holocaust at the age of 46. Petrovic Radmila perished in the Kosovo War. Marigo Rusi perished in the Rwandan genocide at the age of 15. Hamedi Mosa al Hamedi perished in the Syrian civil war in 2014. Ruben Leonardo Passati perished in the Argentine Dirty War. Vladik Rudman perished in the Holocaust at the age of two. Vela Glosman perished in the Holocaust at the age of seven. Giuseppe Alhavdef perished in the Holocaust. Bektich Sakib perished in the Bosnian genocide at the age of 35. Shemal Yamiri perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 61. Esther Gill perished in the Holocaust. Abdul Karim al Hamad al Mohammed al Kabar. Paris in the Syrian Civil War in 2012. Maluk Panchal Lual perished in the South Sudan Civil War. Mohammed Eid al Khawalid perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2013. Almi Ameti perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 44. Abu Kebab perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2013. Khaled Hussein al Qadari perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2012. Lek perished in the Cambodian Genocide. Izya Kershevitz perished in the Holocaust. Ayman Webby perished in the C Syrian Civil War in 2013. Ismenia Jose Reis perished in the East Timor genocide at the age of 20. Yeta Ikowitz published in the perished in the Holocaust at the age of three. Muraguaya Francine perished in the Rwandan genocide at the age of nineteen. Allah Al Dain Tala perished in the Syrian civil war in twenty twelve. Kim Yin perished in the Cambodian genocide. Amar Mahmoud Al Masri perished in the Syrian civil war in 2013. Shakov Gorojinchik perished in the Holocaust at the age of 40. Amy Jose Colmenares perished in the Argentine Dirty War. 
Zoli Berkowitz perished in the Holocaust at the age of five. Zelimovic Ibrahim perished in the Bosnian genocide at the age of 54. Feziri Krasniki perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 64. Anand Chalouet perished in the, in the Syrian Civil War in 2012. Asik Zako perished in the Kosovo War. Sandal Appeljom perished in the Holocaust at the age of 37. Reichel Levenstein perished in the Holocaust at the age of 32. Amir Mahmoud Mah Mah Gazelle perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2013. Karekzee Francois perished in the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Mordechai Vas Diaz perished in the Holocaust at the age of 28. Mohammed Al Youssef perished in the Syrian civil war in 2012. Nazmuita perished in the Rwandan genocide at the age of 62. Kadri Karasha perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 77. Amin Kalaf Al-Ali perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2012. Abdul Alim Mohammed Bakar perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2013. Minas Ibkejian perished in the Armenian Genocide. Anna Seamus perished in the Holocaust. Musa Muliki perished in the Kosovo War at the age of 17. Is Yarmai Jacques perished in the Rwandan genocide in 1994? Mujawabeja Cecile perished in the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Insa Misner perished in the Holocaust at the age of 40. Juliana Lovi perished in the Holocaust at the age of 49. Rafat Osman Al Homsi perished in the Syrian Civil War in 2013. At this point, I thought actually it would be nice to ask you know, I've been doing these name readings for many years. You know, uh, about eight years now, and ever since the first one, um, I've usually asked folks after they read names, what came to mind? Do you have any reflections or thoughts? Um, because in today's program, this is one of the longer portions of time that folks have read names. Um, I think it's a special opportunity just to ask, what was this experience like? What's the meaning of a name in this case? I'm curious if anyone feels inspired to share any thoughts or feelings. Um, after reading. I, if I may, I have two thoughts to share. I noticed I got choked up when I had young survivors. One was three, one was five. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed, and it was, I don't want to say luck of the draw, but Elise got the one survivor of the Armenian genocide, and I saw her facial expressions change, and I was trying to send her virtual hugs. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Yeah, growing up with them. Um, with that always, you know, in the back of your mind and, and your family always talking about it, just reading the names of the rest of them was, was also very sobering, especially um, uh, 
of you know the Bosnian genocide, obviously Kosovo. I was young when that was happening, and I was still in Bulgaria at the time. So it's just it's very sobering to have to read all these names, and I'm I'm honored to be able to do it. They deserve it. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sorry, Anna. Anastasia, let's yes. Yeah. As I was going to say, they're more than just names. That's what I I thought. They're not just names, and and though I don't know more about these folks than what was on the screen, I, I kind of felt them in my heart. Yeah, and um, Eileen and Elise's uh, comments uh, resonated with my, uh, with the story that I told about the guy who saw his uh, sister, mother and sister for the last time. Uh, it's very, very difficult to read the name of a two-year-old. Um, that's the first thing that occurred to me. And the other thing is kind of, uh, you know, the universality of suffering. There seems to be, you know, no group has a monopoly on it. It's pretty much a universal experience. It was, and also for me, when I was seeing the names of the Rwanda genocide, with the last names being distinctly French and the first names being distinctly non-French. Um, in 19, no, let's see, 2005, I was invited to a genocide conference. I was the World War II representative in um, uh, World War I and the Armenian genocide was covered by Facing History and Ourselves. And there was also two survivors from the Rwanda genocide and because their first language was French and they were feeling uncomfortable when they realized that I was speaking about what happened in France, they clung to me for the rest of the conference because that, there was that comfort level with the language. And I was, always try to be respectful when I'm in a diff, making sure I get the pronunciation correct of people's names. And I know David said when we were planning for this that it's a fact that we're honoring them but there is that connection with language and um, that is important to me. So that came through when I saw the, the French surnames of the Rwandan genocide uh, victims. Barry, did you have something? Yeah, I, you know, I'd add, um, everybody's comments are so touching. You know, genocide by definition means there's lots of people who suffered. Um, and so, it's not uncommon when we think, for example, about the Holocaust, the number that comes to mind is six million. Everybody knows that. And for all of the other genocidal experiences, there's huge numbers attached to that. Um, and so that's why this feels so important because it individualizes the experience. Uh, you know, the feeling that I had, I don't know if this is, you know, so far fetched, but it almost feels like we're experiencing that a little bit today um, with the COVID. COVID virus, all of a sudden, you know, in a span of a very few weeks, there's 60,000 people who lost their lives. Um, and because it's happening today around us, and because we see the stories uh, of sometimes of each person, and frankly, because at this point, most of us tend to know somebody, or we know somebody who knows somebody, um, you, you feel it in a different way because it's personalized. It, it's not just those people whose names that we read, um, it's people who suffered alongside of that. It's families, it's parents, um, it's brothers, it's, it's cousins, it's a loved one, it's a friend. Um, and so I really appreciate that you're doing this because when we say the name, we're breaking apart this genocidal phenomenon and we're talking about human beings. It takes it away from a number and talks about a human being. And I think when we do that, there's a connection to the suffering that I think we all need to be mindful of. Um, I, you know, to be honest, I, I don't have that with me all the time, um, but I also don't want to become so distant from it. And so moments like this bring it right into our psyche and into our hearts. And so I, I, it's, I'm looking at these names and I feel bad in some respects that I'm not saying the name, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, I'm doing my best. Um, so the intent is there even if, you know, the, even if I'm not able to say it correctly. But um, I just wanna say to you, David, and to the organization, I, this, this experience is so profoundly important 
um, in helping us remember human beings and the human beings who felt a tremendous sense of loss, trauma, and sadness when those names, you know, disappear from the earth. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, in doing these name readings, we know at minimum we're seeking to create that sacred space mm -hmm. um, to first honor, but then to talk about how we turn that memory into action and to do the necessary work so that no more names have to be added to lists like this in the future, um, yeah. even though as we speak, it's it's happening. Um, Jesse, I, I don't know if you were going to jump in there for a second before your dad jumped in. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for um, not grouping the names by by atrocity because uh, it, I think, um, yeah, creates the feeling, which is the truth, that uh, that uh, this has happened to multiple groups. So even though I have a connection to the Jewish names and Elise obviously has a connection to the Armenian names, uh, that there's a connection that transcends your background and history and that an atrocity to one group is an atrocity to all of us. Yeah, one last thing that I wanna add, and I know we have to run to our next session, um, is that the way that even these atrocities are named are not exactly correct in the eyes of those who experienced it. And that's been part of the learning process for Together We Remember, and for myself as a college student that had never heard of these atrocities until I finally started to you know, get exposure to it um, by choice. Um, you know, the Rwandan genocide, that's not the preferred way to speak about it. It's preferred among uh, uh, folks in Rwanda to refer to as the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Now, we just haven't updated our app yet. Um, as, a, as, a, as a bootstrap nonprofit, it's one of those things where you're like, all right, we have what we have and we're going to move forward. Um, and also, we got feedback from Sam, who was on the previous session, referring to the Syrian civil war. I don't exactly yet know. I have a sense of what his feedback's going to be, but we have to listen to that. And so it's an evolving process. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to note that because I'm sure there's folks watching said, hey, is it supposed to be said that way? Well, it's a learning process for us, and we're very receptive to that feedback. Um, so, yeah. Um, and we have to run, but I just want to say thank you for being a part of this program, um, for helping us pivot to America um, or to this to these lands, um, especially given the session that we're about to have next. Um, uh, so thank you so much for joining. I look forward to building on this relationship and to see how we can continue to collaborate um, on collective memory work, especially Anastasia. I want to I want to talk more uh, next time around. But thank thank you all so much. And uh, Jesse, can't wait to see the film and uh, to honor honor the memory of the character that you represented as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.